Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Gig Harbor City Council study session of Thursday, April 28th, 2022. The time is 2.02 p.m. And I will turn this over to our city clerk for a roll call. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Barber? Here. Councilmember Denson? Here. Councilmember Henderson? Here. Councilmember Likens? Here. Councilmember Rodenberg? Here. Councilmember Storset? Here. And Councilmember Wook? Here. All seven present and accounted for. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, just briefly, Council, before we start, um, we will be having a very brief five-minute executive session at the end of this um, council meeting, so just so you're aware of that. Uh, so we'll go right into our first item, which is our urban and community forestry in Washington presentation. And this will be our senior planner, Roxy Robles. Robles, Robo Robo I'm sorry to put Ro your Robles. Robles. <laughs> Robles, yeah, like no robe. Um. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, thank you. That's a good way to remember. Yeah, my cousin came up with that. It's not the best. Um, <laughs> So hi, my name is Roxy Robles. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm one of the newer planners in the uh, planning division. Uh, nice to meet you all. So um, I wanted to introduce Jessica Lloyd from the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Jessica is the urban and community forestry specialist, excuse me, where she provides technical assistance and project management for urban, uh, around or urban forestry in uh, communities around the state. She's a forester with interest in restoration ecology and community-based stewardship who works in advance to advance the practice of improving ecosystem health for plants and people in a changing world. Her career has taken her to a variety of ecosystems from the tropical Atlantic forest of Brazil to the backwoods of New York City and to the quiet corner of Connecticut where she earned her master's of forestry from the Yale School of Forestry Environmental Studies. Um, we've invited Jess to speak to you today because we recently received a grant from uh, the Department of Natural Resources to uh, start an urban forestry program. So Jess is going to enlighten us about what their program has to offer and how we can make uh, best use of this funding coming our way. So take it away, Jess, thank you. Thanks so much, Roxy, and thanks for having me here today. Um, nice to meet you all and see all of your faces. I think most Zoom meetings I'm in, I actually don't get to see people. So um, it's great to see you all. I've prepared a short presentation, but we should have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, and we're also gonna go, the community development director will go over some of the financial aspects of the grant as well. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see that okay? Great. Yes, yeah. um, well, thanks again for you know having me here to learn more about urban forestry in Washington and the DNR Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, thank you for the introduction, Roxy. Um, I just wanted to congratulate congratulate you all and your staff on receiving funding from our program from our 2022 grant cycle. Um, to fund some really important aspects of urban forest management. Um, this includes a, a tree canopy assessment, reviewing codes and policies and bringing departments uh, across the city together to inform the development of an urban forestry program. Um, all of us are, are really excited about your project and working towards this long-term strategy to manage your city's trees for things like climate resilience. Um, you all have been really great to work with. And so thank you, Roxy, Carl, um, for taking on this project. And um, again, at the end of my presentation, we'll hear from the community development director. So kind of a brief overview of what I'll go over. Um, first thing is sort of what do trees do for us? Why are trees and forests important for cities? Um, I'll talk about what is the urban forest and what is urban forestry really broadly um, and why we should think about trees and cities just as we would any other type of infrastructure. Um, second, I'll talk about um, what we can do for trees. So I'll talk about some of the best management practices for urban forestry uh, and some of the steps that cities can take to get started in developing an urban forestry program, a lot of which the city of Gig Harbor is already um, 
planning to do. I'll go over the Tree City USA recognition program, which is um, sort of a structure for cities to start proactively um, managing their urban forests. Um, finally, I'll talk about the DNR, Urban and Community Forestry Program, um, and let you know about different ways that we can assist the city of Gig Harbor. Um, so why are trees in forests important in cities? Properly managed trees in our urban forests create healthy cities and communities by providing economic, ecological, and many social benefits. Maintaining or enhancing a city's urban tree canopy can provide things like shade, reduce surface temperatures in neighborhood, mitigate air pollution, enhance property values, improve social ties, reduce stormwater pollution, provide wildlife habitat, provide recreation opportunities, and places to rest and relax in dense urban settings. Um, a robust tree canopy can also attract business, residents, and enhance tourism. City trees can also be important for the identity and creating a sense of place in your community. So trees do lots of things for us, but it's important to remember that specifically in, in urban environments and well, probably any environment, trees also need um, a little more assistance from people to maintain their health and in turn um, provide the benefits that we all get to enjoy. Trees in, in forests and cities often require more proactive maintenance and management planning to maximize those benefits. Um, Urban forests are the most sort of extensive, functional, and visible form of green infrastructure in cities. And green infrastructure is the natural or mostly natural infrastructure within a city that provides ecosystem services like stormwater management or air pollution abatement. Um, for a municipality, seeing trees as infrastructure, similar to other assets, can help emphasize the importance of investing in um, in proactive urban forest management. So when cities invest in trees, they also provide more benefits in return. So I just wanted to sort of illustrate some of those quantifi quantifiable benefits that trees provide. Uh, this is a tree inventory with an analysis from um, this tool called iTree within the city of Tacoma. Uh, we're actually looking at just one individual tree. It's a Douglas fir tree. Um, and evaluating the economic benefits that this tree provides for the city on an annual basis. So in this example, um, the tree is providing overall during the year $147 um, of services. Uh, this includes you know, about um, $53 of stormwater benefits, $23 in energy savings, and $6 for carbon sequestration. Um, and $147 might not seem like a lot, but when you start to take into account all the trees within a city, um, these start to look like numbers in the millions of dollars of each year that um, trees provide. Um, yes, just yesterday, we were looking at the tree canopy data with the city staff um, at the landscape scale and the benefits that trees throughout Gig Har Harbor provide each year through this iTree model was estimated about a million and a quarter dollars just from runoff prevention alone. So it's pretty significant. Um, the image on the left here is a map of fire hydrants in the city of Charlottesville. Uh, these are inspected each year to improve responses to fires and reduce risk. You'll notice it looks a lot like the tree inventory map that we just saw for the city of Tacoma. Um, tree inventories and tree management in general are, are really similar to other types of public infrastructure that many cities already manage. Um, tree inventories can include information about tree health, tree maintenance and needs and levels of risk that a tree poses so that city staff can prioritize um, different maintenance needs. So what is the urban forest? Before I talk about sort of different um, management strategies, just wanted to point out all the different components that make up an urban forest. Um, in highly urbanized environments, people often don't realize that they're part of a much larger urban forest ecosystem. You know, you usually think of things like the Olympic rainforest or rural woodlands where timber is harvested, but the urban forest is all the trees where we live. 
street trees, park trees, the tree in your neighbor's lawn that's just starting to bloom, um, the big maple tree that you might eat lunch under when it's hot. Um, urban foresters also think a lot about stormwater and may install things like bioswales or rain gardens that include trees. The urban forest is also, you know, old beech trees at your local cemetery or trees that grow underneath power lines. Um, there are trees in parking lots, along the trail where you ride your bike. There are the small or not so small remnant forests or wetlands that residents use for hiking or walking their dogs. Um, they're also the products you can make from the wood when they have to be cut down. Um, so essentially urban forests are the trees or any woody or associated vegetation in cities and towns. This includes all the trees in the public right of way and on private property. Um, because of all the varying elements I just mentioned, they require a lot of collaboration and partnerships between cities and other organizations to manage. So what is urban forestry? Um, Managing urban forests is a cooperative effort, but it's one which everyone benefits. Uh, at its core, urban forestry is the planting, maintenance, care, and protection of tree populations in urban and suburban settings. Because urban ecosystems are interconnected with so many other parts of urban life, urban forestry takes place at multiple scales, from a neighborhood block to a city park, um, there are multiple stakeholders involved from community tree advocates to city leaders who wanna make their communities healthier places to live. Um, urban forestry can also have multiple goals for things like climate resiliency or promoting public health. Um, and there are many ways to achieve those goals through policy or education or financial investment to name a few. Um, because of the many scales, stakeholders, goals, and management needs that urban forestry operates within, uh, planning and management can be complex. Um, I also just want to note that, that the city scale, there's different stakeholders and city departments that may touch on different aspects of urban forestry, things like a parks department or public works or stormwater our planners, and we've seen a lot of success from cities who sort of collaborate across departments um, and work towards shared goals to manage urban forests. So what steps can a city take to transform their urban forestry program? Um, a lot of cities and towns sort of operate within this reactive side of urban forest management, um, primarily answering to concerns from local residents about hazard hazardous or nuisance trees, um, or some that intentionally don't have data or monitoring information on trees because they don't have capacity to manage them. Um, ultimately, what causes cities to shift from reactive to proactive management can really vary. Um, for a lot of cities, it's you know, advocacy from local residents or new funding opportunities, or maybe a new partnership with a local nonprofit or university that leads in tree planting or stewardship. Um, you know, with the grant that the city of Gig Harbor was just awarded and others um, that have been funded like tree inventories. The city is really well set up to establish an urban forestry program um, and really be sort of a leader in proactive forest management. Um, so what does proactive forest management look like? Um, I just wanted to highlight these four urban and community forestry best management practices. These sort of serve as the foundation um, for urban forest management. And these are the types of projects that are supported financially by our program at DNR. The first is a tree inventory, which is essentially a, a tree census or sample of um, tree data within a defined area. This type of data is collected by people on the ground that record the location and characteristics about an individual tree species um, and condition. Um, it can be used for understanding species age and um, promote diverse health and resilient forests. Uh, it can also be used to manage risk and to prioritize different maintenance efforts. The second is a tree canopy assessment. Um, this uses satellite or aerial imagery uh, to map out tree canopy cover over a defined area. It's used to track large trends. Um, you can look at 
canopy cover across different land ownerships or local needs such as zoning areas, neighborhoods, census blocks, or critical areas and waterways to obtain a clear picture about how to set priorities for urban tree canopy growth and protection. Um, it can also be used to set sort of broad goals for um, growing urban tree canopy. Uh, the third is the urban forest plan or manual. This is a sort of strategic plan that sets big picture goals and objectives related to urban forest policies and planning. And the first, the fourth is an operations or management plan, which helps provide recommendations for the sort of day-to-day -day structure and activities of uh, management crews, departments, or other organizations within a city that manage urban trees. So I want to briefly mention the Tree City USA program, and I'm, I'm not familiar if Gig Harbor has been a tree city in the past, but it's just one of those sort of first steps that a lot of cities take to start more proactively sort of managing their urban forests. Uh, the award recognizes cities that have established the foundation of a self-sustaining urban and community forestry program. Um, these are some of the highlights from the Tree City program in Washington in 2020. I think we're still waiting on so the 2021 uh, highlights, but we have 93 tree cities in the state and these are all across the state on the west side, on the east side, even a few on the peninsula, um, with a wide range of you know, population size and resources. Our, our smallest tree city is the town of Hunts Point, and the largest is Seattle. And the longest running tree city is the city of Ellensburg. Um, the Arbor Day Foundation also created the Growth Award to recognize cities that sort of go above and beyond the tree city requirements and expand their urban forestry program with things like restoration work or open space acquisition, addressing environmental equity, uh, conducting a tree inventory or hosting tree care and stewardship events. Um, they'll also be hosting a conference this fall in Seattle, the Partners in Community Forestry Conference for anyone who's interested in connecting with leaders in urban forestry. And I just wanted to briefly highlight some of the sort of core standards for the Tree City program. Um, if your city is thinking about heading in that direction, the first is to establish a tree board or department. The intent of this standard is to assign the responsibility for the management of community trees. This standard can be met by having a single forester or arborist or an entire department or tree board, um, which is a group of volunteer citizens charged um, with developing and administering a tree management program. The second standard is a public tree care ordinance. This will establish the tree board or forestry department um, and gives them the responsibility for public tree care. It should also assign the task of um, sort of creating and developing a plan of work. So the standard one and two are usually happen together. Um, number three is that the city's urban forestry program must also have an annual budget of at least $2 per capita. This can be achieved through lots of different types of expenditures. And um, this is actually relatively easy for most cities to meet. Um, because it can include things like city workers' salaries that is spent on tree care, tree planting, um, watering and fertilizing, equipment rentals or purchases, um, attending tree care conferences or workshops, um, and also volunteer labor. Uh, the final standard is an Arbor Day observance and proclamation from the mayor. This is when your city gets to celebrate its trees and everyone involved in their stewardship. Um, cities have found really creative ways to celebrate with the pandemic, um, but most sort of traditional activities include some type of tree planting or, or public event. Um, the State Arbor Day passed this year on April 13th, but the National Arbor Day is actually tomorrow. We'll be celebrating here at the Capitol, um, but you can actually celebrate any day of the year to get recognition. So my last topic. Um, what is the DNR Urban and Community Forestry Program? So like I sort of highlighted before, urban forest management takes place you know, across many scales and organizations and individuals. 
um, local government agencies, nonprofits, schools and colleges, community organizations, and residents all have a role to play in stewarding urban forests. Um, our program assists local governments and tribal governments, uh, educational institutions, and nonprofits by providing education, technical, and financial assistance. So we sort of operate in this middle ring here, um, but we wouldn't provide assistance necessarily to private residents or for-profit companies. So our mission is to provide leadership to create self-sustaining urban and community forestry programs that preserve, plant, and manage forests and trees for public benefits and quality of life. Um, we do this by providing technical, educational, and financial assistance to those sort of four groups I just mentioned, um, local governments, education, institutions, tribes, and nonprofits. Um, our program isn't regulatory like other um, parts of DNR, and we're primarily funded with pass-through dollars from the Forest Service. Um, although in 2021, the state legislature passed the Evergreen Communities Act, which will help support the growth of our program and capacity to offer more assistance. Um, so what type of educational assistance do we provide? Um, we often connect communities with different resources and tools for urban forestry best management practices, either by direct request through our newsletter, um, or we have an online urban forestry stewardship course. We also host educational se seminars and presentations. Um, we host workshops on topics like tree pr pruning um, and tree care um, for technical assistance, which is primarily my role. Um, we support reviewing urban forestry policies, tree ordinance is and plans for communities. Um, we also provide guidelines on, on tree selection, tree planting and maintenance tree inventories and tree protection. Um, so if you have any tree related questions, um, you can send me an email or, or give me a ring. Um, we also provide financial assistance uh, in two different ways. Um, one is an Arbor Day reimbursement. So we'll reimburse any tree city up to $500 for an Arbor Day celebration tree. Um, we also have our grant program, which um, as we mentioned, the city of Gig Harbor received uh, funding from our grant program this year. Uh, this was the largest grant um, pool of funding that we've been able to offer. This year, we funded up to $550,000 for urban forestry projects. Um, these include things like tree plantings or food forests or community engagement projects, but the majority of our funding went to assist tree inventories, canopy assessments, and urban forest um, management planning documents. Okay, almost there. Um, I just briefly wanted to touch on the Evergreen Communities Act and a recognition program, sort of similar to Tree City that our program is in the process of developing. Um, the ECA was sort of a landmark legislation in urban forestry for the state of Washington. It originally passed in 2009, but um, the funding was swept during the financial crisis, but it just went into law this year, or no, last year, I guess, on May 11th, 2021. Um, the goal of the ECA is to provide funding for communities to perform tree inventories, canopy analysis, and develop urban forest management plans essentially all those elements of urban forest best management practices that we went over earlier, um, and to prioritize this funding based on needs to support uh, salmon recovery, tree canopy cover, and human health in, um, in cities or communities that are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, so how are we gonna do this? Um, primarily through pass-through funding and assistance. Um, we've also established or will establish the Evergreen Community Recognition Program. This will be sort of in line with the Tree City USA program, but it will allow other types of um, organizations outside of just cities to become an evergreen community. So things like counties or um, other entities that want to be recognized um, 
for their tree care efforts. Uh, some of the elements that will be required for recognition will be things like a tree inventory or urban forest management plan, although this is still in development and we'll keep you all posted. Um, we've already seen a lot of the benefits from the Evergreen Communities Act. Uh, this year we were able to offer our largest ever grant program um, and we'll also be growing our own program with the hiring of several new staff, including an inventory specialist and technician, a grants manager, a GIS specialist, and a contract specialist. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the sort of projects that we're involved with statewide. Um, one of those is the Puget Sound Urban Tree Canopy and Stormwater Management Handbook. So this project promotes urban forestry as a tool for managing stormwater runoff. Um, it was originally a partnership with the King Conservation District and brought together practitioners from both urban forestry and stormwater to look at different tools to measure the capacity of urban trees to manage stormwater and encourage the adoption of different types of green stormwater infrastructure. Um, another statewide project is the Urban Forest Pest Readiness Project. Uh, this provides tools and resources to help cities better prepare for the next potential outbreak of an invasive um, insect pest in Washington. Um, we're in the process of building a statewide database of all the street and park tree um, inventory data from cities that have tree inventories. Um, this, the goal of the project is to analyze the tree inventory data to assess vulnerabilities um, from particular invasive pests based on those insects priority or preferred host tree species. So this project is important for a lot of cities, but especially those in sort of agricultural regions um, that have a lot of um, say apple orchards or other things that could be heavily impacted by an invasive species. Um, we also have the Puget Sound Urban Tree Canopy Assessment Project that I sort of went over with the city staff yesterday. This is a partnership with the Washington chapter of the Nature Conservancy, which conducted an urban tree canopy analysis for every municipality within King Pierce and Snohomish County. Um, this, they also conducted a further analysis to help identify priority planting locations to plant trees to address stormwater management, urban heat island, and social equity. So I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like on this slide. Um, so essentially the project provided sort of baseline land cover data for the 77 cities within um, the three counties, including the city of Gig Harbor. Um, this is just sort of a glimpse at the project. The map shows the different land cover types that were analyzed. So tree can canopy, impervious surface, low vegetation, bare soil, and open water. Um, the city has about 43% tree canopy cover, although this data was from 2017, um, which is actually really high compared to other cities within Pierce County. Um, and lastly, this is just another way to look at land cover data. This bar graph shows the distribution of the current tree canopy cover, impervious surface, and potential planting area. Um, the analysis looked at potential planting area by looking at sort of bare soil and low vegetation, but excluding any areas like playing fields or agricultural fields or airports where you wouldn't want to plant trees. So this is the type of information that you could use if you're thinking about um, setting a, a goal for tree canopy cover or as a baseline to track canopy cover over time. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all. I just wanted to hand it over to Katrina from the Community Development Department to talk about the grant. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Mayor, would you like to see if council has questions before I discuss the monetary? Uh, yes, thank you. And would you like to call on them or would you like me to? Oh, you, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, council member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, thank you, Jessica. That was great. Uh, just very well done and uh, very complete. I had a few questions on this and then I think one might probably will be answered by um, our community development director. <clears throat> so on the 
trees as urban in infrastructure were that that was a yearly monetary benefit right the hundred and forty seven dollars correct an okay. annual benefit and then uh let's see uh, and i i think we might hear from katrina of the urban and community forestry bmps what will this grant fund of those for because i think those seem to be the core or the central starting point of everything um, so I'll wait for her to get back on that. Uh, Tree City USA, is that something the city could join? We, we need obviously the standards below, but we could probably do that soon, I hope. And then uh, I think the last thing on the Puget Sound Urban Tree Canopy Assessment Project, that's pretty awesome, 2017. So your uh, data pretty well, pretty well dated. Um, and then I'm assuming that 1200 or 1424 acres was a kind of a combination of the bare soil plus low vegetation. Okay, so that's probably unfortunately reduced since 2017 because there's been some significant development within the city of Gig Harbor Sports, especially in North Gig Harbor, loss of that large area. So, okay, that's all I've got. I'll, I'll wait for Katrina to talk. Yeah, and I don't know if you wanted me to answer a few of those, um, but I know part of their grant is going to fund sort of further analysis for a canopy assessment and may look at more current data from my understanding, although um, Katrina and Roxy will have more information on that. Um, we have funded tree inventories for the city, city of Gig Harbor in the past, and I think that's um, potentially part of phase two in their, the city's planning. Uh, is to sort of fill out the missing pieces of a, a tree inventory as well. But the canopy assessment will form a sort of uh, management plan or um, for the city. But I'll let Katrina and Roxy speak more to that. Um, I'm forgetting your other questions, but yeah, the, the data was from 2017, so it likely has changed um, significantly, potentially from that time. Um, so that's why it is good to sort of have that canopy assessment. A lot of cities do it every five to 10 years so they can really track canopy coverage. Um, we don't have plans or funding at this time to do that level of project across three counties, but we are funding individual cities to conduct canopy assessments through our grant program. Um, I can't remember the other, if you ask me any other questions. No, that's okay. Now, we're fast firing that. Thank you, Councilmember Wook. Uh, thank you, the great presentation, uh, Jessica. So go, let's go back to that 2017 tree canopy. Are we, does this grant cover a new tree uh, canopy assessment for Gig Harbor? And if not, when can we get a new tree canopy assessment We're done for Gig Harbor? Sure. Um, I can't speak exactly to the details of the grant or the plan. So I might have Katrina or Roxy answer that. Um, my understanding is that some of the budget is allocated um, for a more current tree canopy assessment. Okay. So it will be done under this grant. Yes. Yeah. Or, I don't know. I just want to confirm with Katrina and Roxy, but <laughs> the, we applied to have kind of an urban forest, like a canopy assessment. So kind of the condition of our trees, um, any to kind of assess what kind of risk we might be at. But this is will also be something that we'll need to discuss with the consultant once we get them on board, because consultants have different ways of approaching um, their assessment. So. <clears throat> Once we get a consultant on board, we're going to talk to them about what they think, you know, where, what elements of our urban forest need to be most readily assessed. But we hope to get kind of an idea of our baseline kind of condition of the, the trees. Okay. I guess that means we are going to do a tree canopy assessment? Yes. yes. It's, in, it's um, task 2.1 of our, of our approved grant. Thank you. And so I, I think there's a lot of questions about what the grant will do and what it won't do. So I will go ahead and send that out to council um, probably this afternoon when you're listening to Josh and Annika speak about legislative efforts. And then you can take a look at that. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to um, Carl, Roxy, or myself. 
I'll just add that sort of tree canopy cover is just one metric. And I know the grant intends to look more at um, forest health and forest structure, which is really, really important, especially when I know you're talking about climate resilience and the next part of your meeting and um, factors like that are also really, really important for management. Member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm assuming this will all kind of lead to our urban forest management plan and then could result in code changes for various and sundry things in the city. And uh, I think my question has always been, this will probably precede the comp plan amendment in 2024. That's correct. This will this body of work is going to begin, Roxy, correct me if I'm wrong, but July of this year. And then it's to be completed by July of next year. So that'll be in advance of the comprehensive plan. And yes, the consultant will be looking at our existing code and making recommendations for amending it consistent with the community's goals regarding trees. Thanks. Mayor, if there are no further questions from council, just wanted to briefly discuss the uh, fiscal portion of this grant. You, uh, we know that this is one of council's top priorities, strategic planning, uh, fitting into strategic priority number four. Um, with that being said, within the budget that was approved for 2022, we did not have a specific line item budget for this work. However, after discussing this with the finance director, um, we have adequate funds within the community development funds to, um, to, for, sorry, to accommodate our $35,000 required match. And so right now we're not asking council for a budget amendment because the finance director and I believe that we can accommodate that within existing funds allocated to the department. And that's uh, somewhat due to vacant positions that uh, for instance, Roxy, we hired in the second month, we hired our other senior planner in the third month and, uh, and other items. So. We don't believe we'll need a budget amendment. However, if it comes to the end of the year and we do need some funds, the finance director indicated uh, a minor budget amendment would be uh, acceptable. Councilmember Rodenberg. Yes, uh, Director Knudsen. Uh, in this whole program, have you looked at uh, how much staff time this would encompass? Uh, an additional FTE, or uh, I'm I'm interested in that since we're overburdened uh, with so many other projects. So, uh, have you got an idea of what that might encompass? Yes, for for right now we have this approximately 0.25 of Roxy's FTE handling this, and this would again start in July of this year. Although major kudos to Roxy within her first two weeks of work at the city drafting this grant application and being successful. So. Um, kudos where they're due for sure, but the, the primary effort of this will not be coming until until July. And so we are looking at our, our yearly allocation of hours through our FTEs. And at this point, we believe that we can handle it with existing staff, although Carl and I will have further discussions uh, about that soon. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Katrina. Okay. I'm not seeing any. Does that is that um, wrap that up for you, Katrina, for this item? Yes, that, that completes the item. Just want to thank uh, Jessica from DNR for being for being such a support and helping us along the way. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time and your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to see um what you all do with the grant so keep us yeah. posted and um thanks again for having me thank you so we will move on to our second item which is our climate change advisory body and this is also our senior planner roxy robles great work on the last name did i get it right yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome okay can you all see my screen yes Okay, awesome. So um, city council has prioritized um, climate change in the strategic plan. So I'm going to be presenting kind of a plan for the plan today. Come on. 
All right. So um, the climate change has been uh, yeah, prioritized within your two-year strategic plan. Um, and so to further this priority, council defined several project actions, including forming a climate change advisory body and developing a climate action plan. To get to the climate change advisory body, to get to a climate action plan, there's a few steps we gotta take. At the moment, um, climate change is not mentioned anywhere in our comprehensive plan. So it's really important that we get, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> It's really important that we get climate change back into the comprehensive plan so that we can go forward and make um, policy changes. So um, to do that, um, first step is to form a climate change advisory body. Um, and then that climate change advisory body, through that climate change advisory body, we're going to understand uh, state and regional requirements since um, uh, climate action plans or climate change may become a component of climate comprehensive plans uh, down the line. Um, and then based, and we'll uh, also have topic study sessions to kind of understand different parts of what climate change means for a city of our size. Um, so based on the information uh, shared in our topic study sessions, gathered from the state, um, we can draft an amendment to the comprehensive plan and begin the legislative process for adoption by September of this year. Oh, come on. Okay, so um, to get an idea of just how interdisciplinary we expect this advisory body to be, you can see a number of our internal and external stakeholders listed out here. Hey, I'm in a meeting. Can you quiet down, please? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> So stakeholders who have green stars there on the right side, those are external stakeholders, um, are confirmed participants. We're still waiting to hear back from the Downtown Waterfront Alliance and the KGI Watershed Council, um, but I will be at the next KGI Watershed Council trying to recruit an interested participant. Um, we have a question from Robin. Yes, thank you, Ms. Robles. Um, the question was the Pierce County Sustainability Resources. Pierce County has a um, Sustainability 2030 plan. So are these, was this drawn from the staff that is working on implementation of that plan? I'm not quite sure. They haven't told me exactly who is going to be on the council, just that they will, or on the group. They just, um, they know that they want to be a part of it. Um, but as far as I know, um, you know, they're going to bring that expertise to it. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Member Benson, that the, uh, I had to step away for a moment, but the Pierce County Sustainable Resources, they have just been including us in meeting invites. And so it was a recommendation that we want to include a representative from that body so that we're kind of in lockstep with the Pierce County comprehensive plan as we're informing ours. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much, Director Knudsen. Um, so yeah, and then on the left side, you know, basically involving all of our city advisory bodies and then um, pertinent uh, staff uh, within this group. Um, all right. And so this is a very, uh, preliminary proposed timeline for this. Um, oh, excuse me. And then, yeah, we're inviting council to appoint uh, two council members to this advisory body. Um, just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> okay, so the proposed timeline, um, we're, it's April 28th today, we're having the study session. And then I'm hoping that we can get um, everyone confirmed and a solid crew together by May 11th, uh, that is a Wednesday, I believe, to just start getting um, everybody kind of on board with um, what climate change is and why it's important to address it. And then start recruiting expert external uh, experts to kind of start to uh, educate us on what is important to be thinking about as we think about this comp plan amendment. 
then with the goal of um, having a draft comp plan amendment by August 2022 and beginning the legislative process, getting this to planning commission by September 2022. Uh, this is all the same information, just in a more graphic timeline since some people process things better that way. Um, okay, anybody have any other questions about this? Mayor, if I may jump in just for a moment, thank you, Roxy, for your wonderful presentation. The primary action that we're asking council today, as Roxy mentioned, is to appoint one or two members to the stakeholder committee. And again, this is not a council created committee. This is uh, really a, a project specific stakeholder group. Um, again, for the purpose of looking at these issues to, comp to update the comprehensive plan. So just wanted to make that important distinction that this committee is not necessarily the one that is in the strategic plan that will come from the comp plan, but really this is the stakeholder group that will be looking at the goals, policies, and objectives in the comp plan and how they're going to be um, laid out for the 20-year plan. Thank okay. you, Katrina. Uh, Council Member Wook? Yes, so um, I'd like to volunteer to be on this commission advisory <laughs> board. <laughs> okay, great. Councilmember Henderson. Well, I believe I would too. I think I have a passing interest in climate change. Councilmember Starset. Yes, I would also like to be on here as well. Um, I think just my background in environmental compliance and regulations could be beneficial. Okay, so how do we want to do this? Um, Lottery drawing, or we have three volunteers for two positions. So, <laughs> Councilmember Denson, can we have all three? I think it's great that they all want to participate. Is that a problem? I don't know. I defer to Roxy and Katrina on that. I should have thought of this before this meeting. <laughs> I did I'm not really expect <laughs> there. It's been <laughs> kind of tough for me to recruit external stakeholders. So, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> did not expect to have this kind of problem. Um, I would like to seek Josh Decker's feedback if he has any. I, I don't think it's an OPMA issue or a voting issue because there would be three, but I want to check with Josh first. Yes. I, so yeah, I don't think there will be an OPMA issue with that because we're less than the quorum of council. I think it's just uh, really kind of up to Katrina and Roxy what they want the makeup of their group to be, whether they want to be more council centric or not. I think that might be the issue you'd run into with having that many council members on there. Mayor, if I may, would this just be um, recommendations to come back to the council? Because I, this is a study session. I just didn't know being new here if you took actions like this, but our meeting of May 9th, we do have advisory body appointments on the consent calendar. So would these names be forwarded to the consent calendar for that agenda or do you actually make the appointments at this meeting? We, we can, um, when staff asks for direction in a, in a study session, we can do these types of, of votes or volunteering um, at the meeting. And I, they usually prefer that we do it now at the study session and not wait till the next council meeting. But it, again, I can defer to Roxy and Katrina, you know, how soon do you need to make this decision? Would you like to get back to back to myself and, and Linda, and we can draw the draw from the three names and whoever the first two are, get on the count, you know, get on the committee. I mean, we can do it however you want to do it. Um, and I'll just leave it up, leave it up to you guys. And you can let us know if you want to make that decision now or later. Yeah, they, um, Linda, the advisory boards uh, appointments, those are the boards and commissions that are set out in the municipal code to appoint to since this is a lower level kind of stakeholder committee. It doesn't have an official appointment, but I, I really appreciate you um, double checking that. Um, you know, I think, I think it would be okay to have the three council members on there. Um, the, the reason that we had chosen to just to be honest is um, being a council member comes with a certain level of esteem where um, people tend to work better, you know, I don't, how do I say this? <laughs> I know what you're trying to say. When you, uh, yeah, council member comments can be outsized um, yes. at a committee 
And Thank so you. they carry, carry a lot of weight. I don't know if that's what you're trying to say, Katrina. That is what it, that is, you know, and we want to solicit feedback from all of the people that are at the meeting. That's why we were thinking too. Um, I don't know if council members have thoughts on that. I think my thought would just be, I think it's, I, I totally get what you're saying on how it can seem, you know, maybe dominated by a city council. So I would move for two and I don't know how we go about that. Uh, I don't know if we've had a vote of this situation since I've been on, but I'm, I'm good with that, putting it to the council. Councilman Rodenberg. Yeah, I, I think it's important enough that it shouldn't be random and pulling out of a hat. I think of the three people we ought to look at their credentials, their background, and who would do the very best job uh, on this committee instead of, uh, you know, bless them all for volunteering. But uh, it takes a certain skill set to really uh, add some value to the committee. So I'm not necessarily in favor of pulling random names out of a hat. Okay, Councilmember Barber. Uh, I um, echo what Councilmember Rodenberg just said as well. And I would like to suggest that Mayor Markley and um, City Manager Kelly and Director Knutson get together and um, talk about the credentials of the three people, you know, and the capabilities of the three people that have volunteered and make a recommendation back to council or just appoint the two people that they would choose for that. Councilmember Henderson. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Do you need some credentials from us? Because I'm not sure how much of a background you might have on us, education, experience, whatever. Um, I want to let's hear what uh, City Clerk Stecker has to say, and then we'll move forward with how we might do this. Yeah, Mayor, um, I, I just wanted to weigh in, but typically with these um, administrative level stakeholder meetings, they're there by invitation of the director who's going to be running the meeting. Um, so if council is supportive, and it kind of sounds like maybe you are, then um, we know who's willing to serve. And I think if we can let the mayor and the city administrator and the community development director decide who would be uh, best on that committee, that may be the best path forward. Um, if we get too far into the weeds of council appointing who's going to be on it, then we start crossing into the level of this being a committee created by council. And we really don't want to get there at that point, at this point. Okay. Um, so would it, would it be... Would we have each council person maybe, you know, by the end of the day, send us kind of a, a little blurb with their credentials listed just so we know what their experience is? Or do you already have a good feel for that, Katrina? I think the opportunity to just send something, you know, even credentialing and, and what you feel that you would add to the committee. I mean, it's not, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Okay, so Councilmember Wook and, and Henderson and Storset, then if you would, um, you would, do you see end of day or maybe by tomorrow morning, do you have a, a time frame that you'd like to request that information? I think by tomorrow close of business is fine. Okay, so by tomorrow close of business, just send that information uh, directly to uh, Director Knutson and copy Linda and I on it, if you would please, and then we will bring a, rec a recommendation. Okay, well, we really appreciate everybody's willingness to serve with us on this important yes. topic. So thank you very much. Nice to see council wanting to be involved. It's way more awkward when no one volunteers. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, okay, well, it is 2.55. And so I suggest we take a quick five minute break before our three o'clock presentation. That's okay with council. I'm seeing thumbs up, nods. Okay, all right, we will take a five minute break. It's 2.55 and we will uh, reconvene at three o'clock. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council study session of Thursday, April 28th, 2022. The time is 3.01 p.m. And we are moving on to our third item of business, which is um, our sister city presentation. And we are fortunate to have with us Lisa Christensen of the Norwegian Honorary Consul Alaska. We have Creston Barr, our superintendent of public schools for Peninsula School District. And we have Natalie Wimberly, our school board vice president. 
and Jennifer Stiefel, owner of Heritage Distilling Company. So thank you all four of you for being here with us and um, we're so excited to see your presentation. So I believe, I, um, I don't know who's going first and you guys just kind of take it away. <laughs> and we'll thank hold you. questions until the end, if that's okay. What, would you like us to hold questions till the end? No, or do you, you want to just answer? You can ask questions at any time. Okay. All right. If you if that's fine with you, then I'll just answer them in between. I'll go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Mayor Markley and everyone for having us here today. We have really been looking forward to this. And like Mayor Markley said, my name is Lisa Christensen. I'm the Norwegian Honorary Consul for Alaska. And while it looks like I'm in Alaska, I'm actually right here in downtown Gig Harbor. I have the pleasure of moving here a little bit over a year ago. My fiance is retired Air Force and works at Bremerton for the Naval Base. And we love Gig Harbor. And a little bit after I moved here, I was speaking for the Anchorage Chamber and um, after that presentation, I got a call and said, hey, you know, there's a sister city initiative happening in the city of Gig Harbor, and you should be, talk to a couple people. Well, I did so. And flash forward a year later, here I am to tell you about what has transpired. And I hope you are all as excited as I am. I will share my screen here. Okay. Oh, I was going to try to do from the beginning. Let's see. Slideshow. Oh, there we are. Okay. Here we go. This is the logo that Natalie Wimberly, who will be talking later, created for the Sister City Initiative. And it's on the Sister City Gig Harbor Sister City Facebook page. And if you're not part of the Gig Harbor, Harbor Sister Cities Facebook group, I encourage you to join that and to see what's being posted. There's been some great postings and conversations and information about these two countries that we find so much connection to here in Gig Harbor. And, and I quickly understand why so many people from Norway chose to live in Gig Harbor in the past and why we are so proud of things that are in Norway with all the commonality between our two places. I have a timeline here, which is a whole lot of information. I really don't like doing this, but there's a lot that's been happening this last year. So I think I'm just gonna take a second to just kind of talk about this initiative and what has been happening over this, this well, more than a year. Like I said, I came into this a year ago, but this initiative actually started in 2019. It was an initiative that began with uh, the Rotary Club presidents and our mayor and city clerk for the, the establishment of a sister cities with Norway and Croatia. A committee was formed, the cities were picked, and the two cities that were picked were Selcha, Croatia, Buda, Norway, and that connection with Norway, which is what I'm talking about today, was I recommended by Natalie Wimberly. She was there with her husband, who was flying with the Royal Norwegian Air Force. And she lived there with her family and had a lot of great things to say about it. I didn't pick it. You would have thought that I had because my mother happens to be from Buda. And I go there often. My grandmother's there. My uncle's there. My grandmother just passed away. But cousins, a lot of relatives that I knew I had and some that I'm finding out even this last trip and connections with Jennifer Stiefel, who would have known. But um, I have a big connection to Buda. So I was thrilled to hear this. There has been funding efforts that have been put into this, the first one being um, after connection, well, I should start, go back to the Rotaries. The Rotaries made this connection um, to make it happen and start this initiative, which is really key. We will come back to that again later. Um, dues were paid and funded by the local Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis individuals to join international sister cities organization. A lodging tax was applied for and approved that has not been used yet. And then um, I asked for some money from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I originally thought this was going to be a very easy process. Oh, how wrong I was. Things are never as easy as we think that they are. And Norway has actually, uh, Bulda, Norway has said no to every other request they've received from the United States and many others. And this was actually a big hurdle. 
So a couple different things we did. We did a Heritage in the Harbor Day, um, supported by many organizations and, and uh, groups and businesses here in Gig Harbor to celebrate the Norwegian history in the harbor, but also find an affinity group of people here who are interested in doing more things with the sister city relationship. Uh, then, then um, as things were still taking more time to, to get going, things are always hard when you're talking via Zoom. We had a wonderful Zoom conversation with Mayor Markley and the Mayor of Boulder, and the Mayor of Boulder invited our mayor and us to come to Boulder. And so I asked the Norwegian government for $17,000 to spring some people from both Alaska and Gig Harbor to Boulder so that we can meet face to face. We could have these conversations and we could come together as a group. I had done this before with people in Alaska and found this was very helpful. The Peninsula School District made a significant contribution to also support this effort. And um, the total financial support has been about $30,000 from all these different organizations with the City of Gig Harbor also committing funds which haven't been used for a, another history in the Harbor Day in the future. So where is Buda? I'm, I'll quickly show you here. Here is Norway on the left. The Arctic Circle is right here. And this is significant because Buda is a city up here above the Arctic Circle. And their number one foreign policy priority for Norway and for the city of Buda is the Arctic. So everything that has to do with the Arctic. Um, You'll see from the right here, it's spread out a lot like we are. It's a peninsula coastal town with islands and a fishing history. And you'll see there's a lot of similarities to um, Gig Harbor. There's also a lot of focus. It was interesting to listen to the previous presentations right now on environment and trees and forestry. Norway also has this type of strategy when they talk about the country and for the Arctic and understanding those is important for us as we move forward to um, forming a relationship like a sister city with a country. They also have a large maritime history, uh, a sustainable economic development and harvesting of these these resources right now it's put into a test with their management of a lot of these resources with Russia. And um, they take a lot of pride in that, especially the town of Boulda that has one of the largest cod stocks in the world. They also, once again, are very um, focused on green and smart cities that are growing. There's about 50,000 people who live in Boulda, but they are uh, they are advancing and really thinking about what does this growth look like? What do they want to look like? How do they make a place that people want to live the next generation and raise their families in a, a economically and a environmentally sustainable way? And then so the Ministry of Foreign Affairs sponsored travel for some of us to go to, like I said, to Boulder. And this coincided on purpose with the High North Dialogue, which is a conference that they have every year looking at business in the Arctic. And business is one of the elements of a sister city that is important for these type of relationship. It's also an opportunity for all of us as delegates to go to Norway, to learn more about Norway and to make connections with people. Our delegation looked like this. It was a wonderful group from the far left. Uh, Lori Grover, the president of the school board, she came on her own accord and myself, and then the Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, a young rising entrepreneur in Alaska, and one of our local favorite entrepreneurs here, Jennifer Stiefel, our board superintendent of schools, and uh, Natalie Wimberly, vice president of the school board. These are stock photos of what Boulda looks like, just to give you just a really quick vision of how diverse it is. It covers a big area, it's very spread out, and it looks different, just like Gig Harbor does in the cities versus some of the other areas. Here's what it looked like when we were there, snow still on the ground, it's a vibrant city, the water's not frozen, unlike the Arctic in Alaska here. This is outside of my window of the hotel watching these ships go by. Um, seem like every hour and people down here jogging and um, really enjoying the outside nature, which is important to them. And of course, their maritime history with all the boats. Our first meeting, which seems very appropriate that our, 
our trip started with meeting with Rotarians as this what initiative was started by Rotarians here in Gig Harbor, who connected, we connected with Rotarians via Zoom, but this was the first time to actually sit with them. And they brought us food and we had a wonderful conversation. And I asked the president of the Rotary in Boulder to um, record a message for you. It's very short and um, I'd like to play that. I am Dan Russell, the president of the Rotary Club. We have had a nice time together with the delegation from King Harbor. As I knew, this thing started with an initiative from Rotary, and we tried to follow that initiative. So my uh, request for you is to start with a, a request for us all to do the uh, way we can work together. And I hope you can, as soon as possible, come back to us with ideas about that. Thank you very much. Oops, so he is saying, just tell us what you want to do, local right Rotarians in Gig Harbor, we are with you. He didn't understand how big this was either until he joined us for the meetings, and now he's very excited and wants to work with us for future initiatives. Our meetings then moved to the mayor of Boulder, who's right here. Her name is Ida Pinre who um, received some wonderful gifts from our mayor, Mayor Markley. And she was very thankful and grateful. And she gave me this to give to you, Mayor Markley. So when I'm able to drop this off to you, it is a book about Gig Harbor or Buda. And you will see so many similarities to our wonderful town. And she would like this me to give this to you on her behalf and um, welcome you next time you can come. This is um, some of the meetings we had with students, youth council representatives, the head of economic development for Boulder. And down here's a picture. I don't know if you can see it here on the bottom right corner. It's an art project or art um, depiction on the side to celebrate bureaucracy that they at their city administrator building celebrate bureaucracy and what that means. Um, and so we thought that was actually an interesting twist. Here we are with the deputy mayor. He is showing us the architecture and talking about his city as is the mayor here. We also had dinner with the head of the economic development for the governor for the whole region as well as the mayor to talk about Alaska and Washington and Norway and partnerships. And we took this wonderful photo outside the land of the midnight sun. And here we are with the governor of um, that area, which is a very large area. It is um, much bigger than the state of Washington and his de economic development director at the conference. We also met with students and um, the mayor again. Just really briefly, Sister City International, you know, what does it mean for those who are not familiar with Sister Cities? Here is just a little bit of the background history about what it is. I also put down the bottom about the Rotary Foundation because I really like this grassroots initiative to start this connecting of people and including um, the Rotarians. Of course, this is an agreement between cities and mayors, but it is the people um, who are passionate to continue these sort of relationships and Rotary being one piece of the pie for that. Some of my takeaways here is that um, they are really growing. They like like, like Gig Harbor, there's a lot of similarities, some we knew of and some we didn't know about with airports and um, growing density and trying to attract you know, young people. Um, and that these partnerships will benefit both Gig Harbor and Boulder. We are trying to connect people from different sectors, backgrounds, spark new ideas, which we found out with this very impressive uh, delegation that came. I, you should all be very proud, and I'm very proud of the fellow Gig Harbor folks who came, and I've asked them to come and speak here today to give their perspective because 
there are very good ambassadors to talk about our love for Geek Harbor and our passion to do more with the country of Norway and the city of Bulda that means so much to us and our heritage. And then we had a conversation with the mayor and um, she is excited about this partnership. She said she will sign this MOU with Gig Harbor, which is very good news. Like I said, um, they had said no to many other proposals, uh, but they would like to do something with the, the city of Gig Harbor. So what is the next step? The next step is the MOU. Uh, I've drafted one and sent it to your mayor, the mayor Markley, our mayor, and um, hopefully that can be uh, reviewed and we can send it on to Boulder so they can have a look at it and see what they think. It's very general. It just talks about friendships and cooperation. Uh, there is not any specifics as far as um, projects that need to be done, which I think is important by design so that you're committing to being partners together on whatever is to come in the future, whether that be cultural or economic or students. Um, so it's just agreement to be together. And then also pursuing a Croatia sister city agreement at MOU, another process that has been going on equally as long since 2019. Once again, not as easy of a process as we originally thought. Um, so that is an overview of the, the Sister Cities Initiative. If there's any questions, I can answer those, or we can move right over to Jennifer Stiefel, who can give you her perspective on this trip. Councilmember Starset. Well, first, I want to say thank you very much. That was awesome. And I have, I have heard about this actually from Jennifer uh, running in and meeting her son, too. I know he's participated, so I don't want to steal her thunder, but... Um, I love this. My grandparents immigrated from Norway in the 1920s and settled out here. And it makes me feel closer to, you know, what was home. I think it's very cool. It's very educational. Um, love seeing the involvement too with Alaska. Uh, I had a chance to meet Lieutenant Governor about oh, a month and a half ago or so. A great guy. I wish I could have, you know, I could have talked with him about this with him too, but didn't realize his connection. So um, very cool. I, I love this. And I I'm so glad that they chose us as well. So thank you. Councilmember Rodenberg. Yes, uh, Lisa, I'm curious, uh, has just as much work been done uh, with the sister city in Croatia as it has been with Boda? There has been a lot of conversations between Gig Harbor and Croatia. Um, there has not been a delegation from Gig Harbor that has gone to Croatia, so that has not happened. Uh, but there have been a lot of conversations that have been occurring. So that's not as far along in the process, but um, there's still the, the excitement and the energy and the effort by the individuals involved with that. What do you feel would move that along a little quicker or what, what, does, what do you need to, to help that move along? You know, my, my opinion, and this is why I thought it was so important to bring this, this really strong delegation from Gig Harbor and Alaska together, is people do things when they meet face to face and with people. You know, it, it's, it's having those connections and looking somebody in the eye and telling them with passion why this is important that makes people say yes. And so it's really hard when you do it through emails, Zoom's better in person is the best. So that's my personal feeling. It's also important to know who are the people in the community who are the connectors. We have the connectors, they know each other. Um, we strategically use all of our networks that we had in Boulda um, to really talk this up and, and, and show that this passion came from a lot of different individuals. So those sort of efforts I think are needed for Croatia as well. Any other Thank questions you. for Lisa? Okay, with that, I'm gonna move over to Jennifer Stiefel. Well, thank you for all for having me. I'm Jennifer Stiefel. I'm the co-founder of Heritage Distilling Company. And um, my husband and I have lived in Gig Harbor for 12 years. We've had our company here in Gig Harbor for 10. Uh, this is my third trip to Buda. Uh, I have a lot of family in the area and I walked into the High North Dialogue Conference and ran into a cousin. Uh, so that small town feel that you have in Gig Harbor is definitely 
in Buda. Uh, my family has been to Gig Harbor from Buda twice. Uh, they they came the first time for just a four days and the next time they came for 13. So uh, they feel very much home in Gig Harbor and it was an honor to be a part of this delegation. I grew up uh, in the state of Alaska and also spent significant time in, in Washington DC on the Senate Appropriations Committee. So with kind of this, this trifecta of my growing up and then my experience as an entrepreneur and of course my Norwegian heritage, um, being a part of this was, was a great honor to, to represent Gig Harbor. I see so many similarities between both communities um, are just, and I'm just going to highlight it on a few. One is our fishing industry. You know, you look out on, on the Gig Harbor and most of those boats are, are Alaska families who go up and fish in the Alaskan waters. And Alaska is really important to the United States and to Norway because it makes us a, an Arctic country. But Gig Harbor is especially um, positioned to also be that bridge between Alaska, the Arctic, through our ports, through the port of Seattle, through the port of Tacoma. They already have sister cities in Norway. And for Gig Harbor to be a part of this delegation uh, with a sister city of Buda is very important. We have, we have a lot of residents that work in the, um, the port of Seattle and Tacoma, um, and as well as our fishing families that go up to the waters in Alaska. Um, it's important to strengthen all of those connections. Um, in my past life, you know, I was a teacher at Fairfax County Public Schools, and so the education component to our uh, program was quite moving, and I'm not going to steal a uh, crest in uh, her thunder, but, you know, we always talk about student exchanges. I think a teacher exchange would be so valuable. Um, they also really value their fishing industry and much like what we do with Donkey Creek and our and our Donkey Creek Park and our projects and Harbor Wild Watch. I think there's a natural fit there. Um, and to bring our uh, youth into that process and, and that education would be very exciting. Um, one plug I do have is I thought something that would be so beneficial to the city of Gig Harbor would be the youth council component. Um, it was really refreshing to know that every conversation we had from, from the top delegation of the government down to all the volunteers, they talked about their youth. It came up in every single conversation and it came up in a positive way of how can we include them? How can they be a part of the process? How can they have a voice? How can we look to them for guidance as well? And we had the pleasure of meeting um, some representatives of their youth council and they said that they get support from, um, from the city by just providing a space for them to meet, a, a space to talk about what's important to them as well as what's on the city council's agenda. And oftentimes, you know, they'll speak up and have great ideas and, and the city agrees with them or, or didn't quite see it that way uh, and, and can change their mind. And, and they felt that that was very powerful and it has buy-in from, from the very early start of, of our community, which was really refreshing to see. Um, my son is a senior at Peninsula High School. He's moving to Alta, Norway in August. Um, and it would be a great ambassador for Gig Harbor if he needed to, to buzz down to uh, Buda for an event. But um, we have such amazing ties that he feels he can move from Gig Harbor to Norway and feel very comfortable because our communities are so similar. Um, and our cultural and tour culture and tourism, you know, is, is very important to Gig Harbor as well as Buda. And um, I think Gig Harbor is a unique opportunity to learn more about our Norwegian heritage and kind of, you know, help Gig Harbor build our sister city program. So I'm, I'm gonna pass it along, but for us to get this far with this community in Norway, is a major feat. And so congratulations to the board of the Sister City Program. I'm not a board member, I'm just a huge advocate and 52% Norwegian. Um, so I'm proud to say that. Um, and, and thank you for, for having us. And I will kick it on to probably Natalie or Creston. Not sure who's going next. I think Councilmember Likens has a quick question. Yes. Yeah, not, hi Jennifer, not so much a question, but just a, an excitement to want to talk to you 
and the rest of the delegation. So I've been in conversations um, with our new city administrator, Council Member Storset, and I are actually um, looking at creating a youth council here in Gig Harbor. So um, it is, it's uh, kind of a, a passion project that we're taking forward this year. So I look forward to learning more. Um, I wanted to go just so I could really get some more information on that. I'm glad you all had such a great time and we'll be connecting. So take care. Thank you. Thank you. Preston, if you want to go next. All right. Well, with that, Brenda, I'm going to try and share my screen. And let's see. I'm sorry. I want desktop too. All right. Let's see. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. And can you see the screen? It says schools on both sides of their peninsula. Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay, excellent. I'm going to go really, really quickly here. Uh, okay. Um, what was fascinating as a superintendent, okay, first of all, I just have to thank um, both the, the Sister City Board and anyone that reached out, especially Lisa, reaching out and thinking about students in a different way. Um, I am 100% Norwegian and I've never been to Norway in my life. And um, one of the outcroppings is my last name is Hong, H-O-N-G, which does not sound Norwegian, I know that. Um, however, I actually went to our family farm with Natalie and we knocked on the door and we met other Hongs, which was fascinating and so strange. Um, <laughs> everyone thought I was going to speak Norwegian and I don't understand a word of it other than Lefsa and Ludifus. So, um, but one thing, there's a few things that I think were really fascinating that um, I want you to know. Um, there are schools on both sides of their peninsula. So it's very, it's almost identical to Gig Harbor and Key Peninsula. Pretty fascinating, I found. Um, the Youth Council, Brenda, I had a picture of two individuals. We met a college student as well as the Youth Council in the middle with uh, Natalie and I. And they are elected out of the high school. And so they specifically are interviewed through the high school by the council members, and then they select. And this young man, I believe he was on his third year, um, which is pretty significant to have an, uh, a youth. He was very involved in the arts, which I found fascinating uh, because he was a real um, advocate for the arts in schools. Uh, so I found that really fascinating. Um, when we were in the, I found as an educator, this might have been the very first time I had been in a business, an international business conversation about the future of where our students are going in industry. And things such as blue shift, uh, green shift technology, the geopolitical future, which was ironic that we were there during a pretty um, pretty close to Russia. And so there was a lot of discussion and also the readiness for their students to be able to, all the way down to kindergarten and Barnahagen, um, readiness for their next generation workforce. And specifically around maritime, the space and green technology, which aligns to our strategic plan, which also aligns to our work in public schools, at least in Peninsula School District, to really make sure that our students are prepared for critical thinking skills, 21st century skills. But to see this in action, and I have to tell you, I, can, I have said that I was just floored to see these buses um, on the side of the building when we were waiting at the airport, this little, um, this little lever comes out and the buses are uh, recharged um, within just a couple minutes. I'd never seen that at that level. The cars and vehicles there, you see two super cool vehicles that are out of China. They only exist in China and in Norway are completely electric. And they were talking about lithium battery factories and all of the things that they're educating their students. Um, they have a, a completely different high school format for their 11th, 12th and 13th grade 
where the students are in a trade and they're paid. That, I didn't get enough information and really am very interested. And another thing that I want you to know is that we saw that the future is now. Oslo is very sophisticated. Buddha is very sophisticated. I don't know what I thought before we went there, but I have a different mindset when I'm coming back, getting our students prepared for the workforce and providing opportunities for them to stay in Gig Harbor and Gig Harbor area. We want our children to grow up and I'm a grandmother, I have four grandchildren and I will do everything in my power to keep them in our communities. Um, and um, that starts with our public schools. If you see the little children on the right, we were way up in the top of this very, very sophisticated MOOC museum in Oslo. And there were, uh, there were kindergartners everywhere. You saw them with their little jackets. Um, and they were everywhere. It really was a different mindset of bringing children out, exposing them to the arts, exposing them to the forest, um, and having them be a part of all of the community. We also saw it um, in a Buddha. And so what you see there is a Barnahagen, which is um, ages one through six. They have the right to have the ability to learn and be outside. It was just, it was almost a dream come true. I have to say, I really did fall in love with the concept and the way that children are valued. Um, on the right, you'll see, I don't know what it's called. I call it a super cool Finnish yurt, but I'm sure there's a name for it. Um, but we are really looking at implications of Peninsula School District of partnering. So the people on the left, are experts in early childhood education. They all have their master's degree and they have said that they will partner. So we are already are planning for next year. Um, also in our strategic plan, being, being very explicit about field trips and student teacher partnerships. I already have teachers saying, can we go over for a few? Can we have them come over? So there's a lot of excitement in our school district. Also looking at the high school options and really understanding the green shift and blue shift technology. I think there's a real, um, I have never in my 37 years had so many things that I didn't understand. I'm a biologist by trade and the future is now. It really is. Um, and then only the last two things I want you to know is that we will be implementing an outdoor preschool and we, will, we have partners already from Buddha, but um, these are, it was cold and you can see the same little outfits, um, the little Barnahagen um, vests and they dress for warmth. So that was really, I learned that clothing matters and that it really, they have their children outside, rain, sleet, snow and sunshine. Uh, because they believe that children are healthier when they're outside and playing and having practical applications, as well as building and learning about nature. So it really aligns to where we want to be as a school district and what we want to offer our, our families, as well as it was just sheer fun. I haven't had, um, and they eat hot dogs out in the snow for lunch. Like it was just amazing. And for that, I think that is it for me. So I will stop sharing and I thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I will jump in real quick, but Mayor Markley, I wanted to check with you about time. I, I want to be respectful of that. Yeah, I would, we have about five, maybe 10 more minutes, including question and answer before we need to move on to our next item. So. Okay, I will just do a quick wrap up then because I think these other ladies have really done a great job of um, presenting the trip and who we met with and what we saw. I wanna thank you, Mayor Markley, council members and city representatives. Um, obviously this was an amazing opportunity for us and I, uh, I hope to not say it was a once in a lifetime opportunity because I hope it will be just the first of many for all of us to partner with Buddha and share travel back and forth. Uh, it was a fun trip, but ultimately we had a job to do 
And it's our responsibility to evaluate whether or not we were successful in, um, in finding out if this partnership between Gig Harbor and Buddha would be mutually beneficial and would support a cultural exchange and the sharing of information. And I think uh, that we've demonstrated that, yes, absolutely. I think we were met with support and enthusiasm that exceeded all of our expectations. Uh, on both ends, as a matter of fact. I think um, Lisa alluded to the fact that maybe Rotary wasn't quite sure what their role was or, or what kind of partnerships could be developed out of this. But with every conversation we had, whether it was government, city leaders, county leaders, uh, school and business leaders, each conversation sparked another idea, whether we want to share students or share um, musical performances or work on green technologies or figure out how we can support our local military families and aviation related career fields. There was something at every turn that sparked a wonderful opportunity and, and made both of us realize how similar our communities are. This is Buddha here behind me. It's a, it's got a city center and a, and a large rural surrounding area. It's surrounded by mountains and water, just like we are here. People love to kayak and stand up paddle. Uh, and we found, um, Seth, I'm so glad that you mentioned you had family that has come over here because for every family in Gig Harbor that either came from Norway or has family there, there is a family in Buda who has family in Washington. And as a matter of fact, the phrase, I have an aunt in Seattle became a running joke because everybody has an aunt in Seattle. Uh, so the ultimate takeaway was the development of a genuine friendship between two communities that are already truly deeply connected. And whether you know they're striving to build a thriving Arctic where people come and stay, or we're aspiring to be a global leader in education or a nationally acclaimed community for raising families, we focus on the same things and we have so much in common. Um, and I think this partnership would only enhance already thriving and welcoming communities. So I was super proud to be a part of this delegation. I think you should know that they represented Gig Harbor accurately genuinely and professionally. Uh, and I think that this partnership will only continue to grow in a way that's meaningful for Gig Harbor families and Buddha families for generations to come. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Natalie. Questions are, and comments from council. Council Member Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. I'm like, thank you guys for selecting a city and a country that's just so incredibly eco-friendly uh, I believe Norway, I was looking today, the most eco-friendly countries in the world, and they're easily in the top 10. Um, they are, I have to say, light years ahead, and hopefully we can learn some of their lessons uh, about electric vehicles, solar energy, protection of forests, everything else. I mean, I, I think we have a lot to learn. And so I, I'm very pleased that we've got a sister city like that, hopefully very soon a sister city like that. Thanks. And just to add to that, um, so Innovation Norway, which is the incubator that launches uh, entrepreneurial endeavors in Norway, signed an MOU with Governor Inslee in 2015, which was just re-ratified, or 2019, sorry, was just re-ratified um, by the Norwegian ambassador to the United States just this last fall. So there is already partnerships happening on that level, and they want to do more with Washington State. And so this, this is another great way to help those, those sort of ideas flourish. I like it. Great. And I actually just realized we have until four o'clock. So feel free council to ask questions. And if there's anything else that the four of you would like to add, we do have until four. So uh, council member Wook. What a wonderful presentation this was. What a thorough presentation this was. And thank you for representing Gig Harbor in such a warm and friendly way. And uh, thank you for sharing the story uh, to Boda of Gig Harbor and of our uh, wanting to be sister city with them. This is a great opportunity for both of us. And um, thanks for bringing this information back to us and, and educating us so much on this. So it was a great presentation uh, for a city that I knew nothing about. So thanks so much. Thank you. Councilmember Storset. Yeah, I just want to say thanks again. I thought this was really cool. I'm excited to share this with my family. And Brenda, thanks for bringing up our, our youth council to be. Um, really excited about that just initially, but this makes it like it's a whole other 
you know, a whole other opportunity. So um, we're going to plan a field trip uh, once we get this thing established and, and we're going. OK, um, I don't know who's paying for it yet, but I'll pay my own way if I need to. <laughs> Thanks and again. Oh, and Lisa, we live down the street from each other. Um, we met during the, the last snowstorm. We were out sledding by your house. I know by the logs behind you where you live. So um, beautiful place. Love that house. I took pictures of you and sent it to all my friends. By the way, if you'd like me to send a picture of you sledding down the street, I just loved that, that snow came and I'm holed up and you're out sledding right in front of my door. So that was, that was wonderful. <laughs> that, that is a great hill, as long as there are yeah, any cars on hill. <laughs> And I, and I want to echo again what Jennifer said about the youth and can't, um, and, when, and when you have more of these conversations with Norway, you'll feel it as well. They really value their youth and their youth ideas. They want to know what they think. Like Jennifer said, they don't always take their advice. You know, sometimes it's like, yeah, no, but thank you for giving your opinion, but they really value it. And they want the youth to be involved in everything because things are changing. Technology is changing, life is changing, the world is changing, and what is it going to look like for the people who are going to be there at the time when the world changes? So it's a different mindset that um, is very inspiring and makes a whole lot of sense, and especially for growing communities like, like ours. Councilmember Barber. Yes, thank you. And um, I'll echo everyone's excitement about the presentation. And I had to laugh, Jennifer probably knows where I'm going with this, but the kids playing outside in the winter time, raising two kids in Alaska. Um, yes, we only didn't have outdoor recess when it was below zero. Hello. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's nice to see another community doing that as well. Um, but what I'm wondering what happens next, assuming that we're all excited and Buddha is really excited. So we saw we both saw an MOU. Who's who's in charge and how do we? tailor all of these amazing ideas that we have for partnerships and working together and how do we make sure that we're not going at cross purposes and we all know what the other one is doing is it a rotary led project or who i guess who who moves this forward from here the first thing that needs to be done and i'll let the others add to this too but the first thing that needs to be done is the signing of this mou like i said so many other cities have approached Boulder and they've said no. And so time is a little bit of an essence, in my opinion, just because we've opened that door for them to say yes to an American city and yes to Gig Harbor. So that's that's number one. Can just you sign it today, Tracy? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to let Josh weigh in in just a moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so that's number one. The next, the next step is to decide how is the structure of the sister city group okay. going to be? Is it a committee? Is it a board? Is it a commission? Is it an ad hoc committee? Um, how, what does that look like? And you know, questions about as these initiatives happen, how is insurance going to be covered for those who are involved in that whole process, which is always a question. So that's next. After that, then all those ideas get to start and bubble. And how those happen is really up to people, which is a little bit of the beauty of the rotary okay. with their passion, their drive. There's only a part of it because like I said, it's, it's, it's cultural changes of people and business and um, communities. It's, it's, it's all these different levels. So it's whatever we can dream of and they can dream of and we help each other so that our cities are better for it. Okay. Thank you. So Josh, did you want to sort of kind of outline our our next steps? You know, not not for today. We don't have time today, but we want to bring this back before council with some options of how this initiative would go forward. Um, and so just maybe just kind of outline what what some of those might be and what what currently is in place and then what maybe we can bring forward as an op as an option for council leader. Sure. So the, yeah, basically there's there's two steps for the city that we need to undertake here. And the first one is getting that agreement in place with the cities that we want to partner with. And it sounds like the, the people that have been working on this have gotten us really far down that road and we're really close to being in that position to sign those agreements. Um, and so those should not be difficult to iron out and, and get sorted out and find out you know what we want our relationships to, to be with these uh, these three cities that are being considered. Um, but the second part of that is, how are we going to manage this program? Um, 
the model that we see most often from other cities is there's a volunteer group, an organization that steps forward and, and they will sponsor the program, they'll run the program, they'll organize the volunteers, they'll do the fundraising. Um, they will coordinate all of these uh, efforts and communications. Um, and that's ideally what we'd like to see here at the city. But at this point, we don't have a group like that. Um, there's a sister cities committee that, that, you know, that we were referencing that's a group of about, I think, eight or 10 people that are um, really motivated and doing great work at getting this organized. Um, but they don't have any backing. They don't have any coalition. They're not an actual organization that we could partner with. Um, and so we need that. Um, what we see uh, internationally and, and in other cities is uh, Rotary is a real common group that steps forward and supports these and will sponsor these kind of organizations. Um, we don't have that here. Uh, I don't know if that's a possibility. It's something that we need to pursue um, administratively and find out who can really support this, this going forward, somebody that we can partner with as a city. Um, if we sign these agreements to do a sister, sister city sponsorship and we don't have that in place, then it's going to fall to city staff. Um, and I can point you back to our strategic plan where we've got right on there um, that we're looking to set these sister city programs up, um, but with an asterisk next to it. So it's showing that this is not something that's funded in the budget. And we need to really figure out how we're going to do that. So if it is going to be something where we don't have a community partner that's going to lead, then we're going to have to find the staff time and the resources to organize volunteers and coordinate, you know, events. And um, it's not a... Uh, not an insignificant amount of time. So we need to figure out how we're gonna include that if that's the direction council wants to go. Um, I think the committee that, that has been working on this is, is looking into forming their own 501c3 and becoming an actual organization that we could partner with. And that would be a great approach. Um, I don't know what hurdles we have to uh, cover there, um, but as long as it's some organization that we can partner with, um, that we can have an agreement with, and even that we can help fund and sponsor the city, you know, we can we can give them a stipend to help with, with their insurance or whatever needs they have. Um, but these are details that we're still working on trying to figure out. So um, I think the mayor and city administrator and I will be working with, with this group um, and other people that are interested to see you know, what are the paths forward. And, and just like we've heard from the presentation, time is really of the essence here. We've got people with other cities that are ready to go and we don't wanna lose these opportunities. So. Um, we will be coming back to council soon with, with more options. And I think yes. it's important to remember too that this is a relationship between cities. It's an agreement by the mayors and it's relationship city to city. That's the level of this agreement on their side and it should be our side too. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be bringing options back to council of um, different ways that we can approach this, different ways, uh, you know, we need some time to figure out what the staffing capabilities uh, needs will be, what the time will be involved, um, kind of maybe some suggestions for budgeting for, you know, how much we put towards this effort. Um, I don't think that there's a, an issue with me signing an MOU. Um, it doesn't it doesn't, that can happen before we figure out kind of the, the bones and the structure of how this is all going to work. So if council is supportive of um, the mayor in Buda and myself, you know, signing the, the MOU, and then, you know, just, just so that they know we are committed and, and ready to move forward, I think they're still ironing out on their end how they're going to run theirs, and then we need to iron out on our end how we're going to run ours. So we may be swapping ideas with each other as well about kind of the, the structure of how this would, would function. So, but I think we can, we can at least sign the MOU to just kind of a, as a, in good faith, you know, say, yes, we're, we're wanting to do this, we're moving forward. And then that gives us some time to figure out the structure and, and bring that, bring those options, options before council for how, how this would operate. So council member Henderson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, a question, would it be possible for us to get a copy of the presentation? It was really good and I'd like to just look at it a little at leisure. So a link or whatever would be wonderful. I yeah, think Josh can send that our out. Our presentation is up with the packet for the meeting now online. So if you just go to, the, to this meeting link, you'll see it there. Okay, all right. It wasn't the one that I downloaded earlier. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Likens. 
Yes, thanks, Mayor. Um, so, um, Linda, not to necessarily put you on the spot, but I know that you bring experience from working with other cities. Do you have experience in the, working with sister cities in some of your other cities that you were a part of? Yes, Councilmember Likens, in, in the city of Sonoma, California, we had seven sister cities and we had a sister cities association that was a nonprofit umbrella that all of these cities uh, worked you know, with. So they were our partner. And we also had, I believe, a sister city policy, which is something when we look at bringing this uh, back to council, I would suggest we look at a policy because it provides us with some sort of direction if a, a new uh, group comes forward um with another city and which was happening in Sonoma we had so many sister city requests we had to come up with something so how do we vet these we need to make sure they're supported by a committee is the committee sustainable you know what kind of support is it going to be uh, going to need on long term what kind of funding what kind of budget so it was like criteria that we would provide to these groups and request that they try to you know meet this criteria before the council could consider a new sister city committee Great. Uh, that would be something I would maybe suggest. Great. I also have a, a suggestion um, as Tacoma has 14 sister cities. Wow. So that's a neighbor just right across the bridge that we can also um, lean on. And um, of course, the city of Anchorage and Fairbanks and you know, all these have, have sister city committees. So terrific. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Very, they're very common. I'm kind of surprised we don't have one yet. So great, <laughs> great to start with uh, this city. Great. Yeah. Any other questions from, from council? Okay. Anything, any, um, anything else you guys would like to add? Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, one question I had just since we have a couple minutes, um, you know, you mentioned how involved the youth are over there and that is that's so important to me as well and I love the youth council idea I can't wait to see what's going to happen with that but um I'm, I'm wondering what the the what is the depression rate over there amongst their children and their teenagers compared to what we see in the United States is it is it lower because they're so much more involved in their, and they're around adults all the time and they're out of their school and touring businesses. And I just, I just wonder because we see such a problem here with drug use and depression and suicide amongst our youth. And I just wondered if it was different over there based on how involved their youth are. So Mayor Mark, I will, I'll take a stab at it and then uh, my teammates can uh, pipe in. You know, there were many um, conversations that we didn't necessarily have the opportunity to have. Um, the format of the schools up until age or grade 10 is overseen by the local city. Uh, and then from 11th, 12th and 13th grade, it is managed in the county. So it would be like Bruce Danmeyer would be in charge of all the, they don't call them high schools, but it is their high school. Um, whether they're going college or they're going practical. So that's more of a CTE where the students go into work um, and internships and they get paid. So I think that there's really low hanging fruit. There's been some recent legislation passed around mental health, around outdoor schools in sixth and fifth grade, also around looking at transportation and getting our buses electrified. So I think that there's real low hanging fruit in terms of reaching out to partnerships and really understanding. I would say the only construct that we even talked about, Natalie actually was in a taxi and we were asking about that very thing. And they said that the divorce rate is very, very high because they really don't have marriages. And so when people split that the students and the youth have been impacted. But that was not from an official that I would say was research based, but it was an interesting conversation. I think that those conversations would be really compelling to have. Yeah, and we could also have the Nord University, which they may have some case studies occurring right now. So I this is a really it would be a great opportunity for us to know and understand. And I think we have legislative backing to say, you know, let's look at outside of our area because we know the problems and issues here 
is it more of an international issue, you know, based upon the pandemic or, um, you know, a variety of different things. So I think we could really be a leader really in the nation um, in education, having the conversations. Um, but we did not have that. I was still struggling to understand what blue and green shift technology and what the metaverse was. So I had some <laughs> learning. I don't quite understand it yet. I'll add just a little bit to that. I don't know numbers, but I, what I have heard from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs is that, you know, around the world, like Creston mentioned, COVID is really having a toll on mental health. And we had are simultaneously seeing an increased awareness, acceptance of mental health um, help. Simone Biles is bringing it to the to the stage. You know, so that is happening in Norway as well. They are recognizing that this is mental health is something that people have just like breaking their knee and they need to have the support for that. And they're recognizing that they don't have enough professionals to provide this support that they're all of a sudden recognizing is needed. So I, I, I get the feeling and I understand there's a little bit of a growing pain right now with trying to bring change the stigma against mental health being what it has been in the past, and then also encouraging more people to study that as a profession and bringing more providers and making that more accessible to people for a better society. So that is a very um, high concern for Norwegians, which is a new thing and it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much again, all four of you for being here and for those wonderful pictures and just um, your enthusiasm for, for this. And we look forward to bringing this, bringing options to council really soon. And um, we'll, so I, I think I have direction from council to move forward, at least with the MOU. I saw a lot of thumbs and up and heads shaking. So that's great. So um, Josh and I and Linda will work on that. And then, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll move forward. So thank you again and enjoy your evening. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you do for our city. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. I see. Can we do a quick break? We absolutely can. So we will do another five minute break. We will come back at 4.02. 4.03. 4.03. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council study session of Thursday, April 28th, 2022. The time is 4.06 p.m. And we are on our last discussion item and very pleased to welcome Josh Weiss and Annika Vaughn from Gordon Thomas Honeywell to provide us with our legislative session wrap up. So I will let you guys take it away. Thank you so much, Mayor and uh, Council and staff. Nice to see you all. Now that session is done, feeling much more relaxed um, than last time we talked. And I will just say uh, hello and welcome um, both to Tiffany and Linda, who Linda, we had a chance to talk with uh, last week, I think it was, and really looking forward to working with you. Um, so yeah, I'm Josh Weiss uh, and Annika Vaughn. We're with Gordon Thomas Honeywell, your legislative advocates uh, on the state level. Today, we're just gonna review uh, the 2022 legislative session in general terms. We'll also look at the outcome of the city's priorities and how they turned out. Um, there were a number of additional legislative issues that we ended up engaging in or that we know or will be of interest to the city that we'll cover. And then we wanna start talking uh, already about next steps for next legislative session because uh, it is never too late to be doing that. Uh, so, and I should say also, um, please do interrupt if you have questions. I'm happy to, uh, my train of thought is not always necessarily consistent to start with. And so interrupting me isn't gonna make it any worse. Um, when does the next session start? January 9th. January 9th. Uh, next year, yep. Um, so yeah, this is the this was the second year of the legislative biennium. So it was a short sixty day session. They uh, generally in in short sessions are only doing supplemental budgets. They did do supplemental budgets this year, but they had so much revenue on the operating side in particular that it felt like a regular budget year. Um, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about each of those three budgets that they do did it. Um, pass. In addition to a supplemental transportation budget, they did adopt a new revenue package called the Move Ahead Washington package. 
They adopted the redistricting maps, which was a big step, every, only done once every 10 years. Um, I think most of you recall or know that the Democrats had very strong majorities in both the House and the Senate, and so that really had a lot to do with the type of legislation that was passed and the nature in which it was passed. Um, it's a little bit of a quirk for our legislature that any legislation that was adopted in the first year of the biennium does carry over and can be considered in the second year of the biennium. It doesn't mean that everything is considered, but we did see several proposals that did move forward and have get picked up from where they ended last year. Um, so, you know, all told with new bills and old bills that they heard, they considered over a thousand bills and they passed over 300. Um, it's kind of interesting to me because I'm a little bit of a wonk that that 300, that one third number is really very consistent with what they usually pass in any other year. It seems to be pretty steady at, at about a third. Um, and that's even though obviously we were in a virtual setting this last session as well. Um, here's some you know more detail on the budgets. And I, I will add that we provided a lot of this in all of this information and in a lot more detail in our written report for you. Um, so I'm not going to hit all of these points, but just kind of the highlights. As you probably have read and heard about, the operating budget was extraordinarily um, healthy. Lots of new revenue came into the state. Uh, largest state operating budget ever adopted at $63 billion total. Um, unprecedented move for them to shift $2 billion over to the transportation budget. The operating budget writers don't like to give up any resources that they have to. They also moved um, $650 million over to the capital budget, which is another interesting move. Um, well, I guess I will just say that um, the investments that they made in homelessness and mental health, behavioral health, um, those types of issues, which were priorities, it really did feel much more like an operating budget year. We just saw hundreds of millions of dollars in new spending um, in, in those priorities. In terms of the capital budget, I would say it was pretty average for a, cap, for a supplemental year, so it was not as big as the operating budget. The local community projects program is the area where we were making a request and where we usually are making requests. They allocated $62 million into that category, this capital budget. Last year in the big budget, by comparison, there was $250 million available for local community projects. So pretty average size for that. Um, and a lot of requests this year. We'll talk about that more. Um, transportation budget, the move ahead Washington was really the big, um, the big news in the transportation arena. Pretty extraordinary that they adopted a new revenue package in a supplemental year. Um, that was, you know, a lot of work had been done the last four, uh, two by any, I guess it was for, or two years for uh, new revenue. Um, if they had not had a new revenue package, there would have been a pretty significant shortfall in the transportation budget. Um, that's as a result of the pandemic. Um, about a third, this transportation package was, was able to be done because of revenue that they are able to count from the Climate Commitment Act that they passed last year that will go into place at the end of next of this year. So they had a, you know, uh, several billion dollars of carbon um, cap and trade money that they were able to book and spend. Um, the rest comes from, again, that operating money that they shifted over, a lot of federal money that came through um, the stimulus and infrastructure programs. And then they did raise, they didn't, this was not a capital, this was not a gas tax budget, but they did raise a number of fees. Um, and this has a lot, to, the sources of revenue in a transportation budget has a lot to do with where you saw them spending money. So new spending was, was really robust in areas that they could use carbon dollars on, which was restricted to the types of projects that are um, going to have a connection to reducing carbon emissions. So pedestrian projects, um, active transportation projects like bike lanes, um, and uh, transit, electric ferries, those types of things. The remaining two thirds really went into maintenance for state programs, uh, state culvert responsibilities. There were, I'll talk about this a little bit. There were several connecting Washington 
uh, projects from the last revenue package in 2015 that needed to be backfilled because revenues from that package are not coming in as anticipated. So um, again, we'll talk about this more uh, a little bit in the future here. So our request this year, we had two budget requests, one in the capital budget, one in the transportation budget. Um, we had three policy items that we had put on the legislative agenda for the city. Um, I'll talk about each of these in more detail specifically. On the sports complex, I'm sure you're all aware, remember that this is the second year in a row that we requested $2 million. Unfortunately, it was the second year in a row that we did not get money in that local community project category. The grant that we received, um, half a million dollar grant that we received in the 21 session out of Land and Water Conservation Fund is the only, only money in the biennium that the legislature has put into this. We did receive um, good support from the delegation. Senator Randall, I'm sure all of you remember, came out in December on that rainy dark night with community sponsors and, and had what I thought was a really promising um, meeting. Um, and then uh, so we had that conversation with her, but then both of the representatives, Representative Young, Representative Caldier, supported this, put in the request as well. We, um, on your behalf, talked to uh, capital budget leadership. That was when we started to get really worried, um, learned that the local community project program received over $600 million in request. They had about um, $62 million in capacity. And we were basically told at, at some of those meetings that anything that was over a million was in serious um, trouble and would need to be scaled back. We talked about you know the possibility of scaling this project back but at the in the end we didn't receive anything um the entire district received less than a million dollars um and there were essentially four other projects that received that that eight hundred thousand dollars so an average of um two hundred thousand dollars per project and in our report we give you the whole list of what those projects were so you can kind of see the context for what the delegation ended up prioritizing. Um, so this is something as we move forward talking about the 23 session, we really will want to have a, a talk with you about what's strategic and what to do next on this. Um, similarly, the Highway 16 congestion improvement projects that we've been asking for, for four sessions now, um, at just over, uh, just about one and a half million dollars in projects. You know, you'll recall that um, both the House and the Senate revenue package proposals last session in 2021 that did not pass, they included all of these projects and more. Um, and that was because they included gas tax revenue as part of those projects. Um, they, uh, this new package spends just over 660 million in new state local highway projects. So that was the total pool that was available for this kind of project. Um, so they spent, you know, out of six, six, seventeen uh, billion dollars, they spent 665 million on new local projects, highway projects. So just to give you a little bit of context on this, they spent just about that same amount on three connecting Washington projects that were going to have budget shortfalls. Um, and they you know, spent about an equal amount on those projects as they did for brand new projects in this category. And then they also just for context spent over $2 billion on new mega projects. The um, Columbia River crossing uh, bridge crossing at Vancouver, um, the Highway 2 trestle up in Snohomish County, um, Highway 18, uh, improvements in uh, East King County. So um, really not a positive development. And I will say that uh, Gig Harbor was not alone in not getting transportation projects. There are a lot of, of uh, municipalities out there that are very disappointed and very unhappy about the way this came together. Um, and I also should say that I do think that our delegation pushed pretty darn hard to try and get these in. You can see in the district, um, the projects that did get funded, um, $130 million put into the fund for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, 
I think I talk about this in another slide, but that that should result in a reduction in tolls. But the way that that bill came out, it is not necessary, but it should. Um, the Gorse project received $75 million, which is in the 26th district. I know it's not super close to Gig Harbor, but in the district. And then same thing, the Kitsap Transit um, received funding for an electric ferry. And remember what I said about carbon dollars, those carbon dollars would are able to be spent on that electric ferry. Um, Councilmember Wilk has a big question. Oh. Hi, the, the the funding for the bridge tolls, where did that come from? Um, uh, that would have come out of kind of that general pool of unrestricted dollars, um, like the general fund, the $2 billion from the general fund. Um, it's not specifically designated, so it's kind of hard to tell, but it did not come out of carbon dollars, I think is the main point. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, one other thing about this new revenue package is unlike other packages, which are so, you know, much more state and local project oriented, none of these projects are scheduled out over the 16 year period. And so like Gorst is probably the best example of this. Yeah, they designated or allocated $75 million out of this revenue, but that could happen, that could be allocated in the end, you know, in 15 years. Um, I don't think, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen with that project, but my point is just that there is a lot of conversation that is still going to have to happen about when projects are uh, scheduled to be implemented. And there's, I will also just say, I think there is a lot of questions still about whether the carbon dollars in particular end up resulting in as much revenue as they booked. It could end up resulting in more revenue, right? They're forecasting how that cap and trade program is gonna work, but we don't know yet how that's gonna work. So I guess I would just say there is a lot of uncertainty around even the projects that they did fund. Um, not seeing questions, so I'll just keep charging ahead here. Um, one of your policy priorities this year um, was doing clarifications and tune-ups, I guess I would say, to the police reform bills that they passed last year. I'm going to skip to the last bullet and say I really, um, your Chief Busey really did a very fantastic job communicating um, with the delegation, um, communing with the public about the need for these changes. Um, you know, we had a meeting in particular with Senator Randall at the beginning, Tony, uh, Tony Piasecki and, and Senator Randall um, and Chief Busey and I met and talked about this and he just did a terrific job of articulating the need in a really respectful and, and um, appropriate manner. So as a result, uh, three really significant bills did pass. I, all of them were supported by both law enforcement community and the um, police responsibility community for lack of sort of a better term. Um, I do know that these are improvements. The law enforcement community is very disappointed that 5909, which had to do with vehicular pursuits did not pass. Um, so I think there's some more discussion there. And, you know, I think anybody you talk to about this will tell you that these were all compromises and from different, perspective, some will say went too far, some will say didn't go far enough. Um, but I do think it is significant that the legislature made the changes that they did and did clarify some of the aspects from the year before that they had passed. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of your priorities was around retaining local control. And this was by far the most significant amount of work that we put in for you this session, um, both with, and we didn't necessarily anticipate the way this was gonna go. Um, you know, just a reminder, I know you were all really engaged in this, so you probably remember this well, but House Bill 1782 was the governor's missing middle um, housing and missing middle was defined in the bill to be any sort of multifamily that was up to six plexes, so duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhouses, courtyard apartments, et cetera. And 
it this bill moved around a whole bunch during session um, was amended multiple times but in in kind of the end of the day it would have required cities between 10 and 20,000 to allow duplexes in any zone where there where single family residential uses were allowed so you would lose all permitting authority for uh, duplexes um there, you know, this did not pass, and a large reason it did not pass was because there was zero stakeholder work prior to session. Um, there was basically zero stakeholder work during session. Um, there were a couple of meetings between the proponents of the legislation and municipalities. Um, having, I, you know, I sat at the table, the virtual table, <laughs> for you all at those meetings. And, um, and I know um, Katrina participated in one of those as well. Um, the first one I will say was essentially the legislators explaining to municipalities how they thought the bill was going to be changed. There was no, not really back and forth discussion. And then um, the second one was really focused on around how jurisdictions that had housing action plans in place would be affected and how to maybe give them more credit. Um, so that was only one little teeny tiny portion of that bill. There was really no comprehensive dialogue, which really led to um, a very nasty environment around these bills, um, not productive. We did, you know, I think I mentioned Katrina's involvement. We wrote a letter on this. Um, we um, and, and really appreciate Katrina's help on that, sent it to the delegation. We're on the record with the city's concerns. Um, we were in a lot of communication with the delegation and also with the Association of Washington Cities. Um, so in the end, I, I am actually quite surprised that this bill did not move forward. Uh, I think we're going to have a conversation again next session about these topics. Um, and I'll be really interested to see how the, the elections go, because I think that will affect this conversation. Um, I see Council Member Wook has a yes. question. Right, I think it will come back to the next, uh, the next session as well. So what can you do? Uh, can you set something up? Can you talk to people? Can you get that conversation going before, uh, before next year? Yeah, we've already been in, uh, we, Annika and I, <laughs> have been in conversations with uh, Carl Schrader at AWC. You know, we're, we want to be following AWC's lead on those efforts, um, but helping um, as well. And, uh, I, you know, we'll be, I, I think we'll want to engage as well with um, the, the delegation and with other members of the legislature in the interim a little bit ourselves on that. Hopefully, Great. the governor's office will not put out a bill with no stakeholder engagement. Josh, um, can I add something too? Yes, please. I think at one point there was also concern maybe that there would be a proviso put in um, the budgets that would have something to do with missing middle, but that really didn't happen. Um, so I think that might be a sign that at least from budget writers perspective as well, this needs some more conversations um, before being put into effect. And I also don't know how the elections will affect motivations for this bill, not motivation, but excitement for this bill. Yes, good point. We sure appreciate all the work you did around this bill and to AWC as well. You know, you guys working in tandem together to communicate with us tell us when to testify and what to say and how to really, you know, try to pack the biggest punch to have this not happen. It was very, very much appreciated. All the long hours you guys spent, late nights, you know, I, it, we just thank you so much for your work on this, truly, and, and working with our staff as well to just try to bring this, bring this home and, and make it not pass. So we were, we were very excited that it didn't. <laughs> I, I very much appreciate that. And I will just tell you, I, I um, you know, I'm just um, very disappointed by the outcomes on the capital and transportation side. Um, I feel really bad for the city. Um, 
And honestly, I don't have a very good answer about what we should have done differently in those two areas. Um, so I feel, you know, a little bit better <laughs> just knowing that we had a, a good outcome on this from our perspective and knowing that, you know, we feel better about where it landed um, and that there's more work to go on this. Um, I also, you know, I think we said this during session, but, you know, the delegation really was helpful and it, it had to do with where they were positioned in different situations, but Representative Caldier was, is on the Appropriations Committee. You know, we went to her directly. Um, at that point in time, our strategy was just to put up resistance to the bill. And she sponsored several amendments on our behalf um, that we worked with for her that were part of the broader strategy. And we just really appreciated that from her. Senator Randall was, you know, the Democratic caucus wanted to pass this bill. Um, and I think she was key in the conversations we were having with her were really key in, in, in expressing legitimate concern, especially again, in the really negative environment communication around this bill. Um, I think she played a very important role in that too. So, and, and I'm not saying that Representative Young didn't do anything, but he just wasn't on the right committees at the right times to really be in that same position. And I know he would have been there too with us. Um, so I wanna make sure that we're appreciating their efforts on that. Absolutely. Um, House Bill 1660 was the bill on accessory dwelling units. I wanna say this is the fourth year that the legislature has had a uh, mandate legislation around accessory dwelling units. This didn't pass again. Um, if it had, at one point, this would have prohibited cities from imposing owner occupancy, um, and it would have required cities to allow ADUs basically on any lot, on any lot in the urban growth area. Um, this is another topic that will be coming forward. Um, on culverts, I, I put a lot of emphasis here on salmon recovery because that really was where the legislature went in this kind of topic area. Um, there was there was not a uh, cohesive conversation with the legislature about how to fund local government culverts. This has been something we've been, you know, we being the broader local government community have been pushing on for years. The legislature continues to be focused on the state culverts, which is well and good. Um, but, you know, I think that there's, the legislature is pretty consistently giving us the signal that they want locals to go through the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board grant program for, for our local culverts. Um, their conversation this year was around riparian protection. The governor put out a riparian habitat bill, very similar to the housing bill that had virtually zero stakeholder work. There was another bill that would have um, required integration salmon recovery into the Growth Management Act. Neither of those passed. Um, there is a stakeholder group that the governor's office is supposed to be um, convening this session to talk about riparian habitat in particular. You can see the legislature's direction to the governor about um, you need to do stakeholder work on these things. Um, I don't know that there's really any of these points that I want to point out with specificity for you, but just to know that the legislature, you know, it's been probably 15, 20 years since they, they've had this much interest in salmon recovery, and it seems to be along these areas. Um, I'll pause because I see that Jeff has his hand up. Yes, thanks, sorry, Josh. Jeff, I, um, I just wanted. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to reiterate what Josh was saying about the demand for these grants. As an, an example is, uh, the city has applied for Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board grant uh, that was just approved at the last council meeting. That's for design permitting of the North Creek culvert replacement. Uh, in talking to the grant manager at RCO earlier this week. Uh, usually he said that there would be like 60 projects applying for this. And I think he said there were 600. So it's really at 10 times the demand. And I'm wow. sure the prices are there. So um, yeah, any, anything we can do to further fund that program would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise it's gonna be tough to get money out of that one. You know, sorry, did I cut out? Um, this is one we may want to talk about for the 23 session. We had some success for another client this session who received capital budget dollars for design of culvert replacements. 
basically under the argument that it would allow them to compete better in federal processes, particularly. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a strategy that can be repeated um, in the capital budget in particular. I, I think this is a conundrum for local governments generally, how they're going to fund, if they're going to fund at any significant level culverts. Um, we also, these were all just of interest to you, uh, the body grant, body camera grant program they did establish at the sheriffs and police chiefs um, association. It's, there's no money there for actual grants yet, but the program, the, the money is to establish the program and get it set up. Um, so that may be of interest for, in, for you in the future. Um, I talked a little bit about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge financing bill. Um, this, you know, without getting through going through the gory details, as this was originally introduced, it would have actually been a full payoff of the um, uh, debt obligation. That was the attempt. Um, and it would have been a, a, a 75 cent toll reduction. There was a lot of work that went into the bill about how do you um, technically uh, pay off early bonds um, like you have on the Narrows Bridge. Um, it was reduced, actually originally it was more than 130, I think it was $170 million. That number was reduced along the way um, at, at a certain point. Um, well, when it came out of the House Transportation Committee, it stripped out any of the reductions on actual tolls and basically just said, we're putting $130 million additional towards this project. Transportation Commission has the authority to look at the tolls and what's appropriate with this new influx of um, revenue. Um, Representative Young on the floor of the House offered three substantial amendments that would have improved the bill. Um, those were voted down by the majority. Um, and, and he articulated well, I think, the reason for that, including one that would have retained the cap on not increasing tolls, um, one that have one one sorry one that would have put back in place the seventy five cent um, reduction, um, and then you know Representative Caldier spoke uh, in favor of as did Representative Young in favor of the bill on passage off the House floor, and then of course the whole delegation voted for this. So um, a lot more to be to watch on this to see what the Transportation Commission does, but uh, but an interesting and significant investment. Um, for the residents of your community. Um, the Open Public Meetings Act bill, this gives you, re recall, we are able to meet now um, in a virtual format because the governor has retained a state of emergency and has specifically uh, issued a proclamation allowing local governments to meet virtually in emergencies. Um, this bill, gives you that permanent authority. So once that proclamation does go away by the governor in this emergency to hold remote meetings in additional future emergencies, and that could be a state declared emergency. So, you know, if there's, again, a pandemic or something like that, and maybe there's not a specific um, proclamation that gives you this authority, you, you have that authority in just a general emergency. And then, you know, if there's a local emergency and you need to um, to issue a local emergency declaration, you can go virtually as well. You still have to, there's obviously requirements in this bill for still giving the public the ability to um, engage and provide comment, all those types of things. But um, you do have now this authority on an ongoing basis, which I think we've learned is pretty important. Um, yeah. And Councilor then, oh yeah, Anderson sorry. has a question, I think. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, <clears throat> So HB 1329, we can, is this, do I kind of read this, that we have permanent authority only in emergencies? So when the governor lifts the current COVID emergency, then we'll no longer be able to hold meetings in uh, remotely? Go for it, Annika. You can hold meetings hybrid forever, but you do need to have an in-person place where the public can participate. Or I don't know if the city would qualify for this, but if you held some fully virtual meetings before 
March 1st of 2020, you can um, continue to hold virtual meetings. Okay, but it sounds like hybrid is still okay. No yeah, matter hybrid's what. perfectly fine. And I honestly think that's probably the preference of the legislature is that you have both options, but um, you can hold only in person if you want to as well. Okay, thank you. And then this last bill on the list here um, on the Growth Management Act, it, it changes from eight years to 10 years, the annual review and update um, cycle for your comprehensive plans. Um, this is something that local governments have been asking for since the GMA was passed in 1989. Um, so, you know, many, many years <laughs> that this has been desired. Um, it does require uh larger jur jurisdictions to do a five-year check-in and that does include jurisdictions in pierce county um but i think that's probably moot i haven't talked to katrina about this specifically i think that's probably mute moot for you anyway given the requirements of psrc um so anyway this was a significant gma um bill that passed the session as well Josh um, and Mayor, just to briefly discuss this, we had on our long range planning work plan that this would be due by June 30th of 2024. Uh, with this passage, it would now be due December. So we have an additional six months. So that does provide us with a little bit of staff buffer in terms of FTE support. Great. So uh, next steps, I you know alluded to this before. We we our philosophy and approach is that advocacy is a year-round effort. Um, you know it is always better to be uh, requesting things of your legislators after you've developed a relationship in the interim, and and it's not the first time that you're seeing them. Um, we will work with you to put together a work plan for how you'd like to use our time this interim. Um, there's a number of stakeholder groups in addition to just legislative work on your priorities um, around, you know, I mentioned the salmon work. There is an ongoing uh, uh, work group at the Department of Commerce on GMA um, improvements that, that is starting to get going again. Um, you know, any of those types of activities. Um, we, you know, will want to start talking pretty quickly about your priorities for 2023. Um, there is going to be a pretty big caveat, I would say, this year for your priorities, and, and that is just the amount of adaptation that we need to do. It's, it's pretty hard right now for me to predict what the legislature is going to be like in January of next year. We've, we've got an incredible number of retirements from the legislature. I've never seen this many retirements. We're seeing legislators that only served one term have never been in person in the legislature that are that are retiring. Um, we're seeing a lot of veteran legislators retiring as well. Um, and so there will be a lot of new members moving up into the Senate um, where their house where um, their house members moving up into the Senate. The elections this year, I think, are going to be crazy. And I've mentioned this before. The 26th district is battleground one in the um, fight for the Republicans to try and gain additional control in the Senate. Um, and if you haven't been feeling that already, you will be soon, I'm sure. And then just the other thing, uh, and, and I don't know, you know, they're predicting just generally statewide um republicans to pick up seats in this election year you know given the national um national election forecast but again those are just forecasts and they're really really hard to predict um the economy you know everybody knows it's crazy right now um we all were surprised by how things went through the pandemic do does the state continue to be bringing in sales tax revenue hand over fist like it has been the um, we'll get a June revenue forecast, but then the November revenue forecast on November 4th will be the last one before the legislative session starts. Be very interesting to see what those look like. Um, and so we, you know, we're going to want to talk, start talking early with you about priorities with a big asterisk that says, what are we going to do if something crazy happens? What are we going to do if, you know, the budget is in bad shape? Um, the legislature does meet for pre-session committee days on um, uh, December 1st and 2nd. 
And um, those will be opportunities if, if we want to run legislation this year, it would be great for us to have those bills drafted and ready to go so that we can be down in Olympia um, gathering signatures when legislators are all together. Um, and I do think hopefully, gosh, if we're not in person again, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, hopefully we're in person again and we'll be bringing you down to Olympia next winter to advocate with legislators again. Um, yeah, and so finally, just, you know, we really do appreciate working with you. It, it, it is, we, we don't take for granted our partnership. It is a privilege and we want to say thank you um, and just look forward to continuing to work together. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have at this time. Any questions from council or staff members? Councilmember Barber? Yes, thank you for that um, report. It was really thorough. Um, I'm curious, and I know the elections are gonna play into this, but do you have any strategy for us or anything, any suggestions for us on what we should be doing to prepare for that next legislative session? I'm thinking of Wallachet and also um, the Wallachet improvements and the sports complex what could we be doing even as individuals in the background between now and when the session starts? I mean, I think we need to have a real conversation about the feasibility of the sports complex being funded by the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, and if so, at what amount, what level? Um, I feel like I have a flat spot. I used to have hair right here, but we started banging our head against the wall on the complex. Um, so, you know, like we should talk more, more generally about capital requests. I do think we should make a capital request this next session. It will be the, the big budget and big opportunity. There will be, there should be more money in the capital budget this next session. I, transportation is gonna be rough. Um, they are not, I, they may say, talk right now, like they're gonna do a gas tax package. Um, I don't think that's likely. Um, the impacts of the low carbon fuel standard and the cap and trade system are gonna be go into effect in early 23, and that will likely raise gas prices additionally. Um, so Part of me feels like right now keeping the transportation projects on the list and just continuing to bang away and seeing when a window opens. Um, but I also think it's going to be pretty hard. Um, so uh, those are kind of my initial thoughts, at least on the budget side. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Mayor. Do you see any opportunities for EV funding for cities, for fleets? electrification of fleets or additional, I mean, other than federal funding, of course, but uh, additional EV charging stations. I mean, it seems like that might be another area that we can have some success in. Yeah, I agree. That has definitely been a priority. I know, um, Annika or Jeff, you might know that, remember this better than I do. I, there was an EV, there is EV funding in the transportation budget, but I can't remember if it's a grant program or not. I can't remember the mechanism. I don't know either. They did add a lot more funding into decarbonizing grant programs, but yeah, I definitely would have to look back in the budget to see the specifics of that. And, and Department of Commerce has been working on uh, climate sustainability. I will add on the transportation arena, there, there were a lot of grant programs for like safe routes to school, all of that uh, receive a boost that cities would be able to apply for. So I know that's not our highway projects, but there will be good opportunities in those smaller grant programs in the next few years. That'll be good. I also forgot to mention, sorry, just to keep piling on. We had supported legislation this last year on your, uh, your TBD, Transportation Benefit District, to the statute had said that you had to go out to the voters every 10 years for approval, but you could only do it twice. Um, the transportation, that bill didn't move forward, but the transportation budget does make that statutory change. So you, so you now still have to ask the voters um, for at least the full amount of the sales tax, but you can, and it has to be every 10 years, but you're not limited to two times. Um, so you can go out every 10 years indefinitely 
um, as long as the voters keep saying yes. So, you know, I'm going to think the legislature is going to want to see jurisdictions using that authority for the kinds of projects of the scale that we're talking about. Okay. Any other questions from council or staff? All right, well, thank you both again for your extraordinary work on our behalf. We really appreciate it so much. And um, wish we could, you know, get together under, under more fun circumstances, but we'll make we'll make it fun, right? We'll make this next session fun. <laughs> and we're gonna let them know it's Gig Harbor's turn for some money. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're gonna do it. We're gonna do Amen. it. <laughs> so thank you both again. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the sun. I like I think it's still out. So yeah. have a have a great night. And we'll um we'll talk internally. Maybe send us an email of when we should start having some meetings with you guys and we'll get those on the calendar right away. Sounds great. Thank you so much for the kind words and very nice to see you all. Nice to see you as well. Thank you. Okay, so uh, council, we are going to adjourn for a brief five minute executive session pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101B. And we will have also uh, Director Langhelm uh, Matthew Keogh and Director Knutson joining us. And so what we'll need to do is log out of this meeting completely and log into the link that Josh sent to your email. You should all have it in your email. If you don't, just give them a shout. And then we will log back in to this, to this meeting after we're done with executive session. So we will adjourn right now at 4.50. We will return at 4.55 unless we need to extend. The executive session has been extended for another five minutes until 5.01 p.m. The executive session has been extended an additional five minutes until 5.06 p.m. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council study session of Thursday, April 28th, 2022. The time is 5.06 p.m. We have returned from executive session. No action will be taken. Any, uh, clear, any other closing comments or questions from council regarding the four agenda items that we discussed today? Okay, uh, with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn the study session. Second. Second okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, meeting adjourned. Aye. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.